Hello and welcome to another Mayo Clinic broadcast on the heart.org at Medscape. I'm Dr. Scott Wright, Professor of Medicine and Cardiology at the Mayo Clinic. Today I'm joined by a colleague, Dr. Sharon Mulvey, a good friend and a well-respected colleague at Mayo. Sharon has had an incredible career uh, at Mayo. She, uh, prior to coming to Mayo, she worked in Houston and did some consulting work at NASA. And uh, she's a very accomplished physician and a researcher. Uh, today, Sharon holds the title as director of the Women's Heart Clinic and is a well-known and respected imaging cardiologist as well as preventive cardiologist. She's here to join me in a discussion today on early menopause, precursor to coronary artery disease and stroke. So Sharon, welcome to the broadcast. Thanks so much, Scott. Great to be here. It's great to have you. Thanks for tackling what is a very important and tough topic. Sharon, help us understand what is early menopause? Can you define that for the people watching today? Sure. First of all, what's the average age of menopause in women in North America? I would say around 50, I would imagine. Yeah, it's 51, okay. and the range is about 50 to 54. So early menopause is considered to be if you have a menopause between the ages of 40 and 45, so less than 46. And actually, the term premature menopause is used if menopause onsets before age 40. Okay, so premature is before age 40. Does the onset of menstruation at all predict when menopause might happen? Uh, um, it's more predicted by the family history, actually. Okay, yeah. so what your mom and grandma have gone through, you may go through. Okay. Yeah. Well, is there a difference in terms of cardiovascular risk for surgical menopause, which happens in some women, versus natural menopause, if we may call it that? Sure. Well, I think you're bringing out an important point. There is an increased cardiovascular risk with early menopause and obviously early and premature menopause. Okay. And there have been several studies, smaller studies, looking at, we're going to talk more about that as we go on, but there have been several studies looking at whether there's a difference between natural versus surgical menopause. And indeed, it doesn't really seem that there is a difference. It's just the fact of the matter that if you have an early or premature menopause, that cardiovascular risk increases. And it increases on the order of at least two times. Wow, so twofold risk. That's comparable to diabetes or um, and, and heterozygous FH, maybe. It's yeah. a very significant risk factor. Do you think it's appreciated by the medical community as much as, as the risk that it is? No, not at all. And part of that is actually because um, of the hysteria that almost developed about hormone replacement therapy after the earlier trials, and we can talk a little bit more about that as well. Why don't you summarize for our audience your take on the estrogen replacement therapy studies. Do they raise cardiovascular risks? Do they alter them at all? Do they improve risks? What's your take on that? Right, so we're gonna talk about early menopause and premature menopause, and certainly repleting hormones in those situations have nothing but benefit as far as the cardiovascular system goes, unless there's a separate you know, contraindication to having okay. hormone therapy, such as a breast cancer history or history of a prior um, stroke or or in thromboembolic event. So like a pulmonary embolism would be a contraindication. Right, it would be a relative contraindication relative, in that okay. case. Yes, exactly. But in general, the large studies, and I think we're talking mostly, mostly about the Women's Health Initiative study. Sure. Unfortunately, it was not really a study of what happens physiologically for women. The average age of women enrolled in the Women's Health Initiative was 62. That's well past, it, yes. well, a decade well past the onset of natural menopause in uh, the in United the, States. In the average North American woman. Exactly. And so you're kind of, if, if there is a risk you're mitigating, you started late in the process. Exactly. And I think what we learned from the WHI was that you don't give hormone therapy to women that are a decade after their natural menopause. Like, that makes good sense. But indeed, only well, less than a quarter of the patients that were in the WHI were in the age group of 50 to 60. Okay. There were no women less than 50. And it's not really readily known, but it certainly has been published, that that particular cohort of women, that tertile of women, had a lower cardiovascular risk, had lower events with respect to uh, heart attacks and strokes than did the women not on hormone therapy. So it's a very um, yeah. you know, thought-provoking. So actually, there have been subsequent studies okay. to the WHI, one that we participated here at, at Mayo in, and that was the KEEPS, or Kronos Early Estrogen yes. Prevention yes. Study. And the objective of that study was to look at 
women at the time of their menopause. So, and everyone had a natural menopause. No hysterectomies were in, okay. in this particular group. And all women were administered uh, hormone therapy, which was or an estrogen, either oral or transdermal, and a progestogen. And they were tracked with respect to the surrogate endpoints of coronary artery calcification and carotid intermediate thickness. Okay, which are good predictors of subsequent cardiovascular and neurologic risks. Right, right. And so there was very reassuring data. Um, they were followed for five years, and the data showed that indeed there was no increased risk of increased carotid intermediate thickness, nor increased coronary artery calcification, and there was a trend to less coronary artery calcification in those women who were treated with hormones. And it probably was, you know, a time factor and a number factor sure. as to why we couldn't detect significance. But I think it's reassuring that data that there are no untoward cardiovascular effects when taken in a physiologic manner. So within, actually all women were within three years of their menopause in that particular okay. study. But I think that most most of us that see patients every day that are going through menopause, that have significant vasomotor symptoms, that are feeling very uncomfortable, we can feel very confident in saying it's okay to use hormone therapy as long as you don't have any specific contraindications. Do you feel Kronos was powered adequately or if you were given a budget that was sufficient by the NHLBI, right. would you redo it uh, with higher numbers? Yeah, well, you know, we're never going to be able to repeat the WHI. It was like a $650 million study. There were 16,000 women in each arm, and it's just it's just not going to be able to do that. So unfortunately, you know, the KEEP study was just about seven, 800 patients at a much lower budget. Okay. And so, you know, the, the findings are not going to be as powerful because of that. And the, but, but the trend was suggestive. The trend was suggestive. And I think that, as I said, it gives us confidence to say in our are women who are very confused about using hormones because of their vasomotor mm -hmm. symptoms, that they might be hurting their heart, that we can say, no, indeed, you may be actually benefiting it, but that you know, we, the data is not strong enough to make that statement, so of course it's not recommended for the okay. prevention of cardiovascular disease. Okay. So in, in a guideline document, it might be a 2B indication, certainly not a 3 and not a 1 or a 2A. Well, it's better than moving from a three, which was hormones yes. are completely contraindicated, yes. Yes. <laughs> so, which was actually what was in the, uh, the document for the uh, prevention of cardiovascular disease in women. So I, I think that we have to you know, temper with our, our judgment and our, our common sense, uh, but recognizing that again, the WHI was really a study of older women a decade past their menopause, sure. and that we really um, need to individualize for the patient that's sitting in front of us. I think that's well said. That's true for all clinical trials, and I think generally trials, while they answer a great question, sometimes create even more issues and questions we had not contemplated until we do them because we learn with each study where we have perhaps designed it less than fully adequately or other issues pop up. So this is a, this is a great area to, to, as you say, to personalize the care. What uh, preventive advice do you give the patients, the female patients who come through our Women's Heart Clinic? What can, what can one do to lower one's cardiovascular risk when they're either in menopause uh, naturally or early menopause or they, they feel they're approaching it and they're, they want to do what they can do to prevent heart disease? What's, right. what, what, what can we give our audience today to teach their patients? Well, I think that the onset of menopause is an extraordinarily good time to take stock. You know, most women, it's midlife time. Um, we have been perhaps very busy in neglecting mm -hmm. some of our uh, optimization of our cardiovascular risk factors. So it is a very good opportunity for the physician to discuss with their patient getting things in line. Knowing, of course, your numbers, knowing what your lipid profile is, uh, knowing what your weight is is very important because um, hormones, our natural hormones, and estrogen in particular, have very positive effects on our physiologic cardiovascular benefits. For example, the lipid profile is benefited, HDL is augmented with estrogen, and LDL is decreased. So when we transition into the menopause, mm -hmm. those things, we lose that uh, protection, so to speak. So it's also true that women have a tendency to gain a little weight, and the distribution of that weight may be different more in the central adiposity aspect, which is a of course, as we know, another unfavorable spot to have it for cardiovascular risk. So it's extremely important to take those things into consideration, know what your numbers are, and particularly go into menopause. The more you can be close to an ideal body weight, the better it is. And then, of course, how do we achieve that? You know, 
adequate physical activity and excellent nutritional choices, avoiding portion overdose, so and to speak. And restricting <laughs> calories control. to reasonable yes. numbers, right? Yes, portion control and restricting yes. calories, making good choices. And of course, another good choice is not smoking. It's interesting in some of the studies that have been looked at uh, more recently about um, the Mesa study looked very uh, in detail about women and their age at menopause and their risk for developing atherosclerosis. And they found that uh, women who were smokers had an even higher risk if they had an early menopause of developing uh, early atherosclerosis. Oh, wow. So that's true. And another very recent Swedish study looked at the onset of uh, heart failure in uh, women that had an early or premature menopause. And in those women, the risk was actually increased 40% if they'd had an early menopause and not been treated with hormone therapy. And if they were smokers, it was even higher. Wow. So, it so even observational data, but still the best we have to apply to the patients we see supporting a use of hormone replacement therapy at physiologic doses. Is that fair to say? I would say so, exactly. Okay. Particularly in women with early and absolutely in women with, with premature menopause. menopause. So between 40 and 47 or 46. Right, right, okay. right. That's, that's a very good point. Another important thing is that in women that are undergoing hysterectomy now, mm -hmm. um, the Mayo data actually showed that 40% of women that had a hysterectomy, and it was about 10% of women in the ages of 35 to 45, that fully 40% of those women were getting prophylactic oophorectomies. I mean, maybe the thought was to oh, prevent... Wow ovarian cancer or something. So in 2008, ACOG, which is the Association of the uh, Gynecology uh, Group, they determined that it's not appropriate to do prophylactic oophorectomy or to perform oophorectomy at the time of hysterectomy. That's very important indeed. So women should be aware that if they are in uh, you know, less than 40, less than 45, undergoing hysterectomy, if it's recommended to have the ovaries removed, they need to question that and to know, is this really... And have a discussion right, with their provider. Have a discussion with their provider because that will put them at increased risk for cardiovascular disease subsequently unless they are repleted with hormones. Wow, yeah. wow. Well, that's an important change in the practice recommendation which will hopefully benefit the long-term cardiovascular health of women. And correct me if I, my impressions are incorrect, but the risk of ovarian cancer is substantially lower than the lifetime risk of cardiovascular disease. Well, Scott, you know one in three women die of heart disease, the same as men. And absolutely. That's right. Um, heart disease spares no gender issues, financial issues, ethnic issues. We all have the same risks. It's an equal opportunity killer. It is. It is. Yes. Yeah. It's very true. Well, Sharon, this has been very enlightening, and I know the audience appreciates your expertise today. And finally, I, I have to say that you live what you preach. Uh, I live not too far from Sharon, and I see her running nearly every day. Uh, during the, the temperate season. Uh, I don't know if you run in the winter. You're uh, not out in the winter, but I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not out in the winter any more than I have to be, but uh, you certainly practice this. And I think if our viewers have questions, they can contact you at Mayo Clinic. And you're certainly happy in the Women's Heart Center to see any patients they would like to see where they have feel their particular challenges at providing cardiovascular counseling. So, well, thank you for joining Absolutely. us today on this discussion about menopause, early menopause and premature menopause. And I want to thank Dr. Sharon Mulvey for her great insights uh, for all of us uh, who have joined this conversation, for me as the moderator and for you as viewers. We hope that you will continue to check out future content on the Mayo Clinic page at theheart.org at Netscape. Thank you for joining us and have a good day.